Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. But before introducing the panelists for this particular session, I'd like to first thank the sponsors as well as the supporters for, as well as most importantly, the organizing team for the monumental efforts in pulling this event together. So without further ado, let me introduce the panelists we have. The topic we have for this particular panel is Belt and Road Initiatives as well as China Power Economic Corridor. Disputes and effective methods for dispute resolutions. So, may I ask the panelists to please join us after the photo op, of course? Just a quick introduction before we delve into the panel discussion. Obviously, I understand we're short of time, so I'll try to moderate as best as I can with the request to this panelist to indulge if I try to moderate. Starting from my left uh, first, uh, we have Ms. Kiran Sanghira. She is the Deputy Director of Business Development at the Hong Kong International Arbitration Center. Her experience includes handling administration of commercial arbitrations as well as her experience having previously worked at the Secretariat of ICC International Court of Arbitration in Tallis. On her left is Mr. Emmanuel Jacquemi. He is a partner in international arbitration practice of Sherman Sterling Singapore office. His experience, as I understand, includes international commercial and international investment treaty arbitration under various arbitration rules. On his left is Ms. Olga Volitenko. She is a partner at the law firm of Fanta Partners. Her experience also includes international arbitrations with particular focus on investments in trade disputes in public international law and investor state disputes. On her left, towards the second last seat, we have Ms. Samantha Lordham. She's a senior associate at Freshfields Brockhaus Deringer at the Dubai and Singapore office. She is in the International Arbitration Practice Group. Her experience includes arbitration as well as her achievement of co-authoring the UAE chapter of ICCA International Handbook on Commercial Arbitration. At the last, we have my good friend as well, Mr. Taimur Malik. For most, he will not need an introduction, but for those who don't know, he's a partner at Klein Co. He leads the Global Pakistan, the firm's Global Pakistan practice. He's also part of the public international law, corporate energy practice groups, as well as a focus on BRI matters. He works out of the Bay office. So without further ado and without going deeply into the discussion, I'd like to um, request Samantha if she could provide us with a brief overview in the context of the topic that we have at hand, which is BRI as well as CPEC related effective methods of dispute resolutions. We've heard from the panelists as to what effective methods of dispute resolutions are available. If I would appreciate if you could just share for the audience what methods are available for in the context of these particular projects. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'll start off very briefly in giving you an overview for those of you who may not be particularly familiar with China's Belt and Road Initiative and also with CPAC. Um, and then I'll move on to talk a little bit about mediation in the context of multi-tiered um, dispute resolution clauses. Um, so just to begin, as many of you may know, China announced its Belt and Road Initiative um, in 2013. Um, which essentially comprises um, the development of major projects to improve China's connectivity to the rest of the world um, through, I guess, two avenues. The first is the land-based Silk Road Economic Belt, um, and the second is the 21st Century Maritime Silk Road. That initiative is essentially split into a focus on six different economic corridors, um, of which the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor is one. Um, if you look at um, the area that CPEC covers, it basically is intended to connect the Silk Road Economic Belt from China to the north, straight down the guts of Pakistan, um, to the ports in the south, which will form a maritime connection. Now, if you look at the types of projects that are envisioned as part of um, CPEC, you'll see that it covers energy power projects, it covers infrastructure projects, so um, expansions of highways, railways, expansions of ports, airports, etc., cetera, um, as well as things like telecommunications projects. Now, ordinarily on a more international level, you'll see that multi-tier dispute resolution clauses are common features of construction contracts in particular for those kinds of projects. 
Um, so starting off with um, the first level of dispute resolution probably being negotiations, through to then mediation and or potentially expert determination, which we heard a little bit about um, earlier on, through to then more formal dispute resolution processes such as arbitration or court proceedings and litigation. Now, the idea behind these types of clauses is that they're intended to save time and money by, if not resolving, at least narrowing the scope of the issues in dispute by the time you get to an arbitration. Um, in reality, it can sometimes be the case that, whether it's culturally, whether it's because of the nature of one of the parties, for example, if it's a government entity that has various different reporting structures in place, um, mediation or even expert determination isn't necessarily the best option, and it ends up being more of a jurisdictional tick box to get to arbitration, um, or in a worst case scenario, it can be used as a delay tactic just to delay the commencement of arbitration. Um, I think the point that I want to get across today is that that doesn't always have to be the case. Um, so for Belt and Road disputes in particular, where you're more likely to have a Chinese counterpart, whether that's through financing of the project coming from a Chinese bank, whether it's through the use of a Chinese DPC contractor, whether the arrangement is under some form of concessional arrangement where you might have a Chinese data-owned entity actually running or operating the port or the power project for the next 25 to 30 years. In those situations, I think a more amicable dispute resolution process like mediation can actually have many benefits in the context of the long-term relationship. Now, very briefly before I hand over to, to others to comment, at an international level, there's been various initiatives taken to promote mediation as a stepping stone along the dispute resolution process, particularly for Belt and Road projects. Um, so you have the China Council for the Promotion of International Trade, um, as well as the Singapore International Mediation Centre, who signed a memorandum of understanding specifically for mediation on Belt and Road projects, with the aim of setting up a panel of international mediators with experience for these kinds of projects. Um, you also have the ICC, who issued guidelines for mediation of Belt and Road projects. And then more recently, I think Sarah mentioned on the first panel this morning, you also now have, um, as of August, the Singapore um, Convention on the International on international settlement agreements. Um, that is a UN treaty, it's been signed by 46 countries to date. Pakistan has not yet signed it. Um, but the purpose behind that treaty is to create a mechanism for enforcement um, of settlement agreements, a little bit like the New York Convention. Um, I think while these initiatives provide a legislative framework, um, for mediation as a method of dispute resolution for Belt and Road projects, it ultimately, or its success, ultimately comes down to the knowledge and the willingness of the parties um, to actually engage with the mediation process. Um, so one final comment just to wrap up is that I think that brings us back to the theme of this conference in particular, which is opportunities um, for up-and-coming Pakistani lawyers. Um, to actually get involved, to learn, to educate clients about the benefits of alternative means of dispute resolution um, so that the likes of mediation, while they may not result in an ultimate um, settlement of the entire dispute, can at least be used along the way to narrow the scope of the issues in dispute and to save some time and some money. Thank you, Samantha. Uh, would anyone else like to add anything? I'd like, if I may, just a couple of words to pick up on what Samantha just mentioned about the importance of uh, sharing knowledge about the, uh, the utility of alternative dispute resolution mechanisms such as mediation. In addition to all these wonderful initiatives in uh, Singapore, in Hong Kong, the Department of Justice recognizing how difficult it might be for a particular governments to engage in the mediation process given that it's much less transparent than our arbitration process or uh, in, in international judicial process. The uh, Department of Justice, in fact, has set up um, an uh, investment mediation academy in Hong Kong that, in fact, just uh, um, ended a couple of weeks ago, where uh, participants and representatives of Belt and Road jurisdictions from various uh, ministries of justice and departments of justice came together in Hong Kong to talk about the merits of mediation of disputes specifically that arise along the Belt and Road initiative. And, and that is where um, I, I think 
there's a scope to cooperate with uh, Pakistan and with Pakistan dispute resolution practitioners because they are also welcome to participate in this academy. Thank you. And, and, and Sulman, if I can quickly add from the Pakistani perspective, I, I think we could have saved hundreds of millions of dollars, if not billions, if we had a clear dispute resolution mechanism in our major contracts, uh, with mediation being uh, the pre-arbitration or pre-litigation step. So I think that's what we've traditionally lacked. And uh, irrespective of how and where mediation takes place, I think it's very important for us as practitioners of law uh, and people who perhaps also are involved in the contract negotiation and drafting stages to, to think about it and include uh, a mediation step before parties actually go and litigate or arbitrate. Thank you. I'm just adding from the institutional perspective um, what we've seen actually, looking at uh, a number of agreements, we conducted some research over the arbitration clauses or the dispute resolution clauses that the HKIC has seen um, over a number of years and I think we looked at a thousand different cl clauses. Um, interestingly, despite uh, increased discussion about uh, mediation and multi-tier dispute resolution clauses, what we saw in this research uh, was in fact um, a lot of the clauses that come through to us were not stipulating uh, a multi-tier dispute resolution mechanism. So um, of the, uh, out of the 1,000 that we looked at, it was only something as small as 5 to 8% that stipulated uh, a negotiation, then a mediation, and then an arbitration process. So um, I think that there is a lot more uh, to be done to include those multi-step uh, provisions in the clauses that we're drafting. But incidentally, a lot of our cases also do settle. So I think, as we all know, you don't necessarily have to stipulate the process in your arbitration agreement. You can pick up a mediation process um, at any point uh, and in fact, it can be very useful sometimes where it's not mandated by the clause, but actually parties have a real intention uh, to mediate uh, during the course of an arbitration, for example. But I just wanted to share some of the, the clauses that we've seen when it comes to multi-tier dispute resolution. Thank you for this. Um, so we've just briefly touched upon uh, the pre-arbitral steps that are there. Now, in terms of considering that CPEC-related projects and PRI-related projects, at least in the context of Pakistan, will primarily involve Pakistani parties as well as counterparties which are based either in the People's Republic of China or they're based in Hong Kong. In Pakistan, foreign arbitral awards enforcement mechanism is codified under a statute passed in 2011 known as the Pakistan Recognition and Enforcement of Foreign Arbitral Awards. Just for the benefit of the audience, I wanted to understand what's the position of enforcement and validity of foreign arbitral awards against uh, defendants which are based, let's say, in the People's Republic of China or Hong Kong. If I could just ask anyone in the panelists to please elaborate. I'll uh, cover the uh, People's Republic of China, uh, perhaps. And there's no surprise there that uh, given that when the PRC um, has ratified the New York Convention, then enforcement of foreign arbitral awards in the PRC uh, would be conducted within the framework of the New York Convention, meaning that there would be two distinct phases uh, of uh, taking your award and bringing it to China in order to uh, get paid under the award. The first phase would be applying for a recognition within the relevant Chinese courts, meaning that as a result of that process, the enforcing party would convert a foreign arbitral award into the judgment of a Chinese court. So that would be the first phase. And then uh, there would be enforcement, meaning that uh, the, the award converted into a Chinese court judgment would then go through the enforcement process Process, uh, using the various means that are available in China, including seizing assets, working with bailiffs, finding those assets, and eventually recovering the uh, the amounts available. There are, as, as you would all know, very limited grounds um, under the New York Convention that are available to the uh, uh, to the resisting party to actually resist. Uh, the uh, recognition of the award, and, and those grounds are, are uh, entertained by, uh, by the Chinese courts. And the statistics uh, of enforcing foreign awards in China is, is actually quite good compared to a number of other jurisdictions. It's about 70%. 
And the importance uh, of, um, of what is happening in China in terms of enforcement is that China is a special jurisdiction because it has a reporting mechanism, meaning that if a court of lower instance is minded to refuse recognition and enforcement of an arbitral award, then that is reported to the Supreme People's Court, which will then uh, look into the case. So we do have uh, uh, rather accurate statistics as to uh, what awards, uh, uh, the number of awards that are not being enforced. Thank you. So it's quite interesting. Temur earlier mentioned that it's quite important for pra practitioners and contract drafters to seek the importance of building in the pre arbitral steps, and obviously, you will need to have an arbitration agreement related provisions built into the contract itself as well. So, just taking you from that, if Emmanuel, I would like to ask you. What are the most important considerations in choosing a seat or venue for arbitration? If you could just elaborate some and give some insight on that, please. Yeah, thank you very much, Sam, and, and good afternoon, everyone. I'm really, really delighted to uh, be invited today and to be here again in Pakistan. Before I talk about the seat, maybe just one little point on enforcement in China. It's, it's true that statistics are very good, and indeed they have this reporting mechanism, uh, which means that it's difficult for lower courts in China to refuse enforcement because it has to go up to the higher court if they want to refuse and then it has to go up to the Supreme Court. The only problem um, uh, uh, with an enforcement in some respect, uh, uh, and I know you're very familiar with that, is the detail because the devil is always in the details. And sometimes you will face practical problems and it doesn't go into the statistics. For example, you go to enforce your world and the court tells you, oh, I'm sorry, the address is not, is not correct because the defendant doesn't live here. And then you go to the other court and say, oh, but the address is not correct either because the defendant doesn't live there. Or it happened to me one day that I had a problem with translation. You need to, if you want to enforce your award, you need to translate your award into Mandarin. And then the award needs to be legalized and it needs to be notarized by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of China. And so we went to uh, have our award translated. It was translated into Chinese. And when we wanted to have the award certified by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, it says, oh, it's impossible. We can't certify that. And the reason for this is that the award mentioned Taiwan as a country. And the ministry said, I'm sorry, but Taiwan is not a country, so we can't certify your award. Mm -hmm. And we said, look, wait a minute, the contract says exactly the same. The award was just copying the contract, and you did certify the award, the a translation of the contract a few years ago. We said, well, but we don't care. I mean, today we can't certify the award because it's not a country. So we never got a translation, and we never be able to uh, enforce this award in China. So this doesn't go into the statistics. So, so one of the problems in China is that you face these type of difficulties in practice when you want to enforce your, your award. Uh, now on the seat of, of the arbitration in, in Pakistani Chinese dispute, um, the, the seat of the arbitration, just like the seats on which we are all seated in this room, is one of these things that are essential and we tend to forget about it until we realize it's broken and we fall on the ground and then the damage is already done. So it is indeed essential to have a robust seat of the arbitration in all arbitrations and, and of course the CPC disputes are, are no exception. And um, I think in terms of consideration, you, you might want to keep three things in mind. First consideration to choose a seat of the arbitration. Ideally, you might want to have a seat of the arbitration that is neutral, different from the nationality of both parties, so neither Pakistan nor China, uh, because one of the main benefits of international arbitration is precisely not to be subject to the national courts of each of the parties of the dispute. So a neutral seat might be uh, something to uh, keep in mind. Second consideration, you want to choose a seat in a country that is a member of the New York Convention. That is important because you will make the recognition and enforcement of the award much easier. For example, in China, China will not recognize and enforce awards pursuant to the New York Convention if these awards have not been issued in a country that is also a member of the New York Convention. So if you want to enforce your award in China, it is essential that you select your seat jurisdiction on these arbitral proceedings and therefore I will ignore the entire arbitration injunction and the arbitration will proceed. Well, if the seat had been in Pakistan, the situation might have been very well different. The arbitrator might have considered that indeed he had to obey the anti-arbitration injunctions of the Pakistani court and the arbitration would have stopped. So in these cases, the choice of the seat, as you can see, might have very important practical consequences. It goes for Pakistan, the same goes for China. So for some of the dispute, it might be of interest to the parties to have a neutral seat of the arbitration. And if you look 
uh, at Asia, if you look at seats that, number one, are part of the New York Convention, number two, are favorable to arbitration, where the usual seats in Asia, you will have Singapore and Hong Kong, and I think Kieran will say a few words about Hong Kong, in the Middle East, Dubai, in Europe, the traditional seats are London, Paris, Geneva, uh, Stockholm. I think that's that's the usual that's the usual choices that parties would usually make. Thank you, Manuel. That was quite uh, informative on at least and learning on my part as well on this. <coughs> if I could just connect that, so I understand that there is neutrality for arbitrations is quite important. It's quite favoured by the parties, especially when it comes to international cross-border transactions. But can you give us a bit of an introduction as to, we've seen recent BRI and CPEC related initiatives, and I want to take the steer the conversation towards that as well. I know that there has been a Beijing Arbitration Commission that has been established or promulgated recently with the rules coming in force, I think, in this year, earlier, and a China International Commercial Court. Um, Emmanuel, if I may trouble you, can you give us some introduction as to what the court involves or the establishment, or if any of the other panelists have some input on it? Are they specifically created for CPEC related disputes, Beijing Arbitration Commission, as well as the China International Commercial uh, Court? So, so you have okay. So you have several things. Um, uh, there are a lot of things in your, in your question. So one is the uh, uh, arbitration institution. So indeed, the Beijing International Arbitration Center is one of the arbitral institutions established in Beijing. They are very dynamic, especially on the international scene. They are doing a lot of marketing and they are very proactive. And, and indeed, the way they manage their cases is, is very efficient. And indeed, they have been focusing on uh, disputes along the Belt and Road Initiative, including uh, Pakistan. Uh, but it's not the only arbitral institution in, uh, in, in Beijing. So Beijing International Arbitration Center is one of them. CTAC is another one of them. And, 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 and we've heard this morning that SICA has signed uh, an agreement with CTAC uh, very recently, precisely to focus on this dispute. So that's for the arbitral institutions in Beijing. And then you have others in other regions of China, of course. Uh, now, you also have this new uh, animal in the in the in the Chinese uh, dispute resolution scene, which is the the, the Chinese International uh, Commercial Court. So these were established in 2018, and the purpose of these courts. So there are two of them: uh, one in Shenzhen, one in Xi'an. Uh, they are part of the Chinese Supreme Court, and the objective of these courts is to facilitate the resolution of international disputes. And how they did that? So in, in terms of jurisdiction, they have jurisdiction for cases when. The parties choose to submit their cases to the Chinese International Commercial Court, and it needs to be big cases, more than, I think, 300,000 RMB. Or if the cases are transferred to the International Commercial Court by the Chinese High Court, Higher People's Court, or if it concerns international arbitration done by a number of arbitral institutions. But that's litigation. So the purpose of this is to facilitate the resolution of this dispute. How? By having a panel of judges that are, number one, specialized in the resolution of international commercial cases, and number two, bilingual. And they also made the rules of evidence more flexible. So unlike normal dispute before Chinese court, you'll be able to submit evidence in English in front uh, before the uh, Chinese International Commercial Court. Now, that being said, this is purely litigation. Um, and one of the things that this commercial court has been heavily advertised is trying to do is to create what they call a one-stop shop for a dispute resolution. And they indeed are trying to establish some link between this international commercial court and arbitration and mediation. So one example of that is the creation by the commercial court of a panel of foreign experts. So I think 30 foreign experts were appointed on this panel. And these, pan these panels of foreign experts, or these foreign experts, will be able to be appointed in mediation cases uh, created or transferred by the commercial court from litigation to mediation. So that's one link that they're trying to create. And the second link with arbitration is jurisdiction of this international commercial court over all of the arbitration cases that are handled by a list of arbitral institutions in China, CTAC and the Beijing International Arbitration Center being one of them. So if there is a challenge against an award issued by CTAC or by the Beijing International Arbitration Center, instead of going to the normal Chinese court, it will go to the Chinese, to this commercial international court. Thank you. 
Can I just pick up on a few points because you very kindly mentioned that I might. Um, so uh, with respect to uh, the first point that Emmanuel addressed with respect to, to seat, I uh, completely agree. Neutrality is crucial as is enforcement and having a pro-arbitration uh, system through the courts and the legislation. Um, just for, for members of the audience who might not appreciate uh, this, it might be worth mentioning at this stage, um, when you are looking for uh, a seat in a Pakistan-China uh, context, when you're looking at options that are available to you, when you think of China, you may also think of Hong Kong and the HKIAC. Um, you'd be right to do so from the perspective of it being one country, but it's important to note at this stage that there are two very separate and independent legal systems there. So when Emmanuel mentions the uh, mainland Chinese arbitral commissions, HKC is a foreign arbitration center, is not listed in that context, and we operate in Hong Kong under a common law system and very different arbitration laws. So that's the first point to make. Um, and bringing that back to the point of enforcement, um, so Hong Kong and China have a unique arrangement, uh, which is very much based on the New York Convention, but it was introduced when um, Hong Kong was returned to China in 1997, well actually a few years later, to fill in the gap because Hong Kong is a separate legal uh, jurisdiction and therefore Hong Kong awards are considered to be foreign arbitral awards when they go into mainland China. So we have a mutual recognition and, in, uh, recognition and enforcement arrangement. Again, um, important to note there in terms of the track record of enforcement of HKIC awards in mainland China and to support uh, Olga's uh, comments about things certainly improving when it comes to enforcing foreign awards in mainland China, I can say this. In 20 years, only three HKIAC awards have not been enforced um, in mainland China. So um, I think the position is improving, uh, certainly, and, and Hong Kong is in a good position there, but completely note the points that Emmanuel mentioned about the practicalities on the ground. The final point to mention is with respect to interim measures. So as was pointed out, um, until very recently, you could in fact only get interim measures in relation to an arbitration if you seated your arbitration in mainland China. Now, um, that's not uh, necessarily a bad thing to do, but when we're talking about neutrality, often the non-Chinese counterparty isn't comfortable seating their arbitration there. So often, and what we have seen over the years at HKIC and in Hong Kong, is that um, HKC has become uh, the institution that handles the highest number of mainland Chinese related cases outside of mainland China. So we've seen on our cases year in, year out, um, certain measures that would be very helpful if they could be obtained uh, with respect to disputes involving mainland China, i.e. preservation of assets, preservation of evidence and preservation of conduct on the mainland with respect to the mainland Chinese entities involved in our cases. So what was quite groundbreaking was on the 1st of October this year, so just uh, over a month ago, an arrangement came into force between the Hong Kong Department of Justice and the Supreme People's Court in China, whereby um, parties to arbitration seated outside of mainland China in Hong Kong that were administered by qualifying institutions of which HKIAC is one, could now seek interim relief from mainland Chinese courts in support of their Hong Kong seated arbitrations. Now this is the only place outside of mainland China where this is possible. So um, this was a major, major development uh, and very much a groundbreaking um, arrangement that's been entered into. To put it into context, and I will finish in a second, um, it, the, the arrangement came into force on the 1st of October 2019 and in the first 10 days uh, HKIAC received um, five applications, so that's one every two days. And out of those, uh, we've now received a sixth. Um, and out of those that we've received, uh, the parties then took their applications to the relevant intermediate people's court in mainland China. And one of those um, applications has uh, been ordered um, already. All of them were for the preservation of assets, so it's a real issue. Um, and the courts there um, have engaged in the process, and it was the Shanghai Maritime Court that uh, ordered the first um, order under that new arrangement. So um, it is worth thinking about uh, the seat in terms of neutrality, uh, and certainly this new measure, I think, uh, really makes Hong Kong a, an interesting option. Um, but it's important to note the, the separation 
cooperation between Hong Kong and China to really understand that. So hopefully um, I've given you an indication there. Can I just take a cue from what you were speaking about earlier about recent developments that have taken place. Now, just try to bring some context to the main topic that we had, which was a focus on the BRI and CPEC related disputes. May I trouble you to just give an introduction or an overview if any BRI or CPEC specific related initiatives have been taken by any arbitral institution or any particular court as such? Yeah. Um, yes, and I'll keep it really brief, um, and unsurprisingly I might limit my comments to HKIAC, but welcome the other panellists to comment on, on the other institutions. I think for, um, for uh, well, saying that, for institutions generally, I think it's very important that we respond to the Belt and Road Initiative. Um, given the size and scale of it uh, and given um, China's core involvement uh, overseas which will be intensifying and certainly um, maybe new uh, to a number of the jurisdictions, the emerging jurisdictions along the Belt and Road. So first and foremost it, it is important for institutions to do that, um, to make sure that the receiving um, or the counterparties and the receiving governments are aware of the options available to them. Um, I think uh, the key thing uh, for HKIC has been really uh, to ensure that we're, we're reaching out to those jurisdictions and we're reaching out to the potential um, categories of user that may be involved in a Belt and Road uh, type dispute. And I think that Samantha outlined uh, very clearly the types of disputes that we might see and the parties involved. But we're looking at, of course, governments and state-owned entities in a number of the emerging economies uh, that make part uh, of the Belt and Road Initiative. Um, and Pakistan is clearly one of those, so hopefully uh, we can continue our outreach here. And also to engage on the various, uh, to ensure that we have the tools uh, to handle the types of disputes that might arise. Again, Samantha mentioned construction is a core part of the Belt and Road Initiative, um, as are complex project finance disputes, and also um, you know, supply chain matters, uh, getting goods and services to these projects. So again, for HKIC, we've, uh, we introduced in 2013 a number of different tools under our administered arbitration rules, which, for example, are dedicated to complex uh, arbitrations, i.e. multi-party, multi contract disputes, so an ability to consolidate multiple arbitrations, to bring in additional parties through joinder provisions that are uh, far-reaching, um, and also to allow parties to commence an arbitration uh, under, uh, commence a single arbitration under multiple contracts. All of these things are um, tools that uh, are not specific to BRI, but that are incredibly relevant when you're talking about some of these major complex um, disputes that are arising. So um, for us, it's really uh, making sure that we have um, the tools available for the relevant uh, disputes, going to those jurisdictions and engaging with the government, judiciary, business, and the legal community. So they understand what it means uh, when you have, um, you know, a Chinese counterparty that's proposing various dispute resolution um, options. And the other part uh, which supports that is uh, we've created a committee that uh, consists of not just disputes lawyers but also um, private banking sector, multinational development banks, um, in-house counsel from construction companies, project lawyers as well as disputes lawyers to kind of inform um, the dialogue that we're having. Um, but I know that other institutions are also of course uh, looking at this area because um, it would be great if all the disputes came to us, but I, I'm not sure we have the capacity to deal with them, so very happy to share the workload. So just continuing upon that same thought process, if I could just ask the panelists, we've heard your input and insight on the Hong Kong International Arbitration mm -hmm. Center. If I could just invite the other panelists, will it be worthwhile to consider a specific arbitration or a dispute resolution center specifically for BRI or CPEC related projects? Would that be a worthwhile effort to do on anyone's part? I, I'll uh, tip in there and this is um, an idea that indeed is, uh, is not new. There has been ideas in the past to set up an industry specific dispute resolution center or indeed a dispute resolution center or an arbitration center that would cater to a particular geopolitical initiative or, or would be limited to a particular geographic scope. And these, uh, indeed these centers have been created in the past and they operate with, uh, uh, with uh, varying degrees of success. 
for example, if you look at uh, those arbitration centers that are set up specifically to cater to a particular industry, then those are rather successful. For example, if you look at maritime disputes or sports arbitration or, or uh, financial disputes uh, or other industry-specific disputes, then those are operating in, in Hong Kong on the basis of the HKAC and in uh, other jurisdictions. But there have been centers that have been set up for a particular geopolitical uh, uh, process that, that exist, but, but they do not have that many cases to administer. And I'm, uh, I'll perhaps mention uh, one of the initiatives that would be interesting in, in the context of uh, China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, and that is the, uh, the two centers that were set up in uh, Johannesburg, uh, but also in, uh, in Beijing as part of the uh, uh, China-Africa Joint um, Arbitration Commission. And that initiative was indeed set up to cater to uh, the outbound investment from China and into Africa, hoping that these uh, two centers would be utilized by, uh, by Chinese and African parties to resolve uh, their disputes. The centers were set up a couple of years ago, and they uh, haven't had any cases to administer so far. And the question then begs, uh, indeed, if, and, and I know I might be a contrarian on the panel given the uh, latest developments in, uh, in Pakistan, but, uh, but these particular centers, the question there is whether they would only contribute to sort of the graveyard of defunct arbitral institutions or whether they would have something so fundamentally new from the existing institutions that the bodies would find uh, would find it beneficial to use it. And if you look at these uh, uh, Chinese African centers, well, uh, one of the ideas, and that's a standard idea, would be to set up a panel of arbitrators that would understand both the African parties and the Chinese parties. But uh, other institutions uh, do not limit their appointments to uh, arbitrators who are listed on the panels. And in fact, parties to an arbitral process are free to select the arbitrators that they desire to, uh, to resolve their disputes. So setting up a particular panel is not necessarily a groundbreaking advantage. And then, and then um, usually those new arbitral institutions would come up with a particular set of um, uh, rules, arbitration rules, to, uh, to administer uh, disputes. But then if you look around the world, if you look at the uh, Asian arbitration centers or the ones in Europe, they already do have rather developed uh, sets of um, uh, procedural rules to administer their disputes, and those rules are more or less the same. So unless you come up with something that is so so uh, groundbreakingly new in terms of procedure, it will be difficult to justify the existence of um, of a specific new center. And I think. What, uh, what matters here is to listen to the needs of the actual users of the system of the Chinese businesses operating along the China-Pakistan economic corridor, but also of uh, Pakistani businesses and perhaps state authorities who engage with Chinese businesses to see what sort of dispute uh, resolution mechanism would be so new that would justify um, its own existence. And that question is indeed open to, um, to the debate. Thank you. So continuing on that, wait, and I now want to focus more towards, now just narrow it down further towards Pakistan-related recent developments. We've heard that CPEC authority has recently uh, been established, perhaps the matter is up to this at the moment, but in the context of dispute resolution, what role, if any, does it have in relation to any CPEC-related disputes? And Temoro, obviously the question is going to be directed to you. And are there any measures that can be taken in Pakistan to work with the CPEC related or BRI related disputes more effectively resolved? Thank you, Zulman. Uh, first of all, it's great to see a full house at this time, uh, not usual. And also to see it's not just about opportunities for the next generation. I think it's still very much uh, a subject area for the present and the past generations as well. So I think we're all welcome to contribute to it and be part of it. Um, you said that this subject matter may be sub uh, uh for the Pakistani audience, obviously. You know, they would realize that the word ordinance is perhaps, uh, the term is uh, a bit controversial at the moment. So CPEC authority uh, has been established uh, through an ordinance, and for our international guests that means it's been issued through a presidential ordinance, which is issued if the parliament is not in session. 
so, but despite that, in terms of its uh, content and structure, uh, the interesting thing to note is it's, it's definitely nothing uh, compared to the Chinese African authorities or courts that have, you know tribunals that have been talked about. <clears throat> Its role is limited to monitoring and evaluation of CPAC projects, and uh, that too of a certain uh, value and nature. Uh, it will have a membership of a chairman, uh, two executive directors, a director general, and, and whatnot, but it's still a small team. So its scope really, we don't envisage it to be more anything more than a monitoring and evaluation authority. It's going to be part of the planning, development, and reform division. Uh, so it's also not standalone in, in, in that sense. It's definitely not intended to be involved in dispute resolution of any form. Um, there is provision for uh, issuance of rules and regulations and for other things to be added to the scope of the authority, but we have to consider if it's part of the planning development reform uh, division. Uh, you know, it's uh, and it's going to follow the rules of business of, uh, of the government. Of course, uh, there will be limitations in, in that respect. Uh, but if, if, if I can add something to this, uh, Salman, it won't take too long. See, this, the other thing to keep in mind is CPAC and CPAC contracts and projects is not just about the, the 50 big CPAC projects, right? There are going to be lots of, which could be between the state or large organizations here and large state SOEs or other entities from China or elsewhere. It's also about a lot of contracts, subcontracts, and, and all that that will go on to actually enable the implementation of these large CPEC projects. And frankly, given the costs associated with international arbitration, I, I mean, arbitration itself just can't be the solution. Really, that's not the reality. So uh, it's been mentioned earlier today, including uh, by our keynote speaker, Mr. Matu Malika, the, the our judiciary role needs to be increased and improved as well. Right? So a lot of things will end up on the judiciary's shoulders as well. So we have, uh, I mean, if you take the, the Chinese International Commercial Court, which is part of the Chinese Supreme Court, was mentioned you know, as two examples. And one of them, for example, is specific to Silk Road projects and, and so on. So the Pakistani judiciary, uh, I can think of many uh, instances, including green benches and human rights benches in terms of specific uh, subject matter uh, related uh, benches of the superior courts, which uh, were established by the judiciary itself to tackle disputes of a particular nature. Right? So green benches in relation to environmental matters. So I don't see a reason why the judiciary can't you know, do something within its existing framework to set up specific CPEC benches to deal with CPEC related matters which may not necessarily uh, be able to go to arbitration for various reasons, whether because of quantum size or, or whatnot. Uh, and you know, build the capacity of those dealing with, with those particular ventures at least. So uh, I, I think that's uh, something that I would like to advocate and, not, and in the interest of the thousands, if not the hundreds of thousands of contracts that are going to be done around the large CPEC projects. Thank you. Thank you, Tamil. It's been quite an insightful uh, discussion with us so far, but towards the end, I, and then we've touched upon a quite interesting topic as well. I'd like just a few minutes if we could give to the audience to engage in any questions that anyone has. I see one over there on the right hand side. Uh, hello. Um, so, I'm a I'm a human rights activist working there in Pakistan, so I'm a bit uh, out of my depth when it comes to international arbitration practices. But uh, recently, in Hague, they've uh, announced guidelines for dismissive human rights arbitral guidelines. So the idea is that victims of dismissive human rights abuse can use arbitration and arbitral proceedings for their benefit. Uh, it could be an excellent uh, remedy that could be provided to victims. Because currently the problem, I, I think a lot of small businesses, human rights abuses, specifically with multinational companies, that the company is dependent in residing in a state, residing in another state, and the victims are usually residing in another state. And the victims are usually so poor, they do not have the capability to uh, 
whom the corporate can in the data uh, today. So that's why now the world is looking at arbitration and arbitral uh, international arbitration as a uh, mechanism to address that under the business and human rights scheme. Uh, so specifically for CPEC, uh, one of the biggest fears of CPEC is uh, human rights abuse by Chinese corporations. Unfortunately, uh, there is a bit of a reputational bias against Chinese companies. Uh, there are loose paper, and uh, there's a lot of fear in states such as Pakistan and others. Uh, you know, the people who would be working with these Chinese corporations who would be working under them, the labor, and the people they will be providing us, the citizens of Pakistan. We would not have adequate redress. So I just want to ask specifically from the representatives from the uh, from the Court of Arbitration and the Hong Kong uh, Arbitration Centre. What is the type of mechanism the centre can come up with to address DHR concerns and how can uh, international arbitration be set up? Can we convince Chinese corporations and other international corporations to voluntarily sign up for some type of agreement where business and human rights victims, uh, victims of business and human rights groups, can come in arbitration to see Thank you. Um, I'd like to keep the context of that relevant to CPEC and at least the Chinese contractors. Um, obviously, the question is quite wide ranging, mm. but if I could uh, ask Kiran to lead and give us some input on it, please. Um, I think it's a very, very important topic um, and uh, something that probably should be considered uh, much more widely. I mean, I think we, we have. Um, heard of challenges to investments that have been made uh, by China, but not uh, uniquely and certainly not all of the time. Um, but for HKC right now, I guess it's something now that you mention it that I that I think about. It's not anything that we have seen handled already by our institution. Um, as to whether it's something that institutions, um, you know, need to consider and move forward. And I think it's, it's obviously a very important area. Um, I think that's a way of me saying right now we haven't seen uh, seen that or, or aren't addressing it, but clearly it's something that should be considered. Uh, 